Good morning and welcome to this virtual program by LA County Library. My name is Lawrence, a Makemo librarian, and I'll be your host today for How Online Propaganda Works. Now, I would like to introduce our presenter, Oleg Kagan. Oleg is the library's community engagement coordinator, and he'll be showing us today how online propaganda works. Oleg, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Lawrence, for that introduction. I appreciate you being here, and I look forward to you running our Q&A later on today. So today's program is going to be on a topic that I think is pertinent to all of us, and that is how online propaganda works. And one of the things that I know that you'll take away from this program is that Propaganda is everywhere online. It is pervasive. I'll be giving some examples of that. Now, before I get into those examples and showing you how it works, I want to let you know that I'm not a propaganda expert. I'm a librarian, so I have some expertise in the information landscape. So I've been doing propaganda research or research on what other people have said about propaganda. But even for experts on propaganda and even to a greater extent, online propaganda, it is a, an extremely complex topic, like inception-like complexity, where it's like a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream. It requires knowledge of geopolitics, individual people and kind of what they do in the world, government capabilities, and of course, a technical know-how to know what's possible to do online when it comes to info subterfuge. And this is partially why during the course of this presentation and the content that I'm gonna be providing to you, I've relied on academic and newspaper articles, reports from cybersecurity firms and other resources, because I really wanna get you a well-rounded view of what online propaganda looks like these days. That said, the very idea of propaganda is controversial. I think the only thing not controversial about it is that it exists. Everybody agrees on that. And part of the reason that it's controversial is a lot of people conflate the truth value of propaganda, you know, what it's trying to get people to do or what it what what it's trying to say or convince you of and the methods of propaganda. And so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be describing a lot of the methods, and I'm going to stay away from telling you about the truth value of what it is. And I'll talk more about truth value later. Um, what I'm not going to tell you is if something is true in a very clear-cut way, because the idea of truth and propaganda is in itself a complex topic. So the description of today's program and you would have read this if you got in our newsletter. Dangerous and deliberate online disinformation is a fact of our digital existence. Get a glimpse into how it works and learn to recognize examples in your own online life. And really, with the complexity of propaganda in the online environment, it really will be just a glimpse, but I think it'll be an enlightening one. After today's program, you should be able to define propaganda and break it into a few categories that might be useful to you. you, might, you want, I want you to be able to recall the examples that I use and also to critically analyze information online generally, whether it's state-sponsored propaganda or just your cousin posting something from a website that is less than truthful about the information that they provide and the way that they provide it. So let's get into what is propaganda. Propaganda is the use of various persuasive techniques in order to spread a belief, opinion, or action, or mode of behavior, and have it be accepted through an emotional response. That definition is from the Gale Encyclopedia of Psychology, which you all have access to through our website. Now, the key words here is various persuasive techniques. Now, oftentimes, these are not any different from your average public relations campaign. 
So one thing I, I read is that propaganda is really just state-sponsored public relations and sometimes public relations that is unethical or nefarious. And my definition of propaganda throughout this program is that it's state-sponsored, even though that may not be an accepted definition of propaganda as a whole. I'll be talking about state-sponsored propaganda today. Now, another key word here is propaganda creators try to incite change through many vectors, what people believe, how people act, and to change or to bolster patterns of behavior. But all of it comes down to one thing, emotions. So propaganda doesn't try to give you a logical argument. It tries to, like this World War II poster, make you feel something and change your behavior, etc., based on that feeling. So we see this poster here, Don't Let the Shadow Touch Them by War Bonds. And anyone looking at this poster will have some sort of feeling. The poster of, of children surrounded by a shadow of a swastika. Kind of makes you want to go buy war bonds in order to save the children. A controversial but important idea is that propaganda is not necessarily untruthful. Now, this comes from the entry on propaganda in the Encyclopedia of Foreign Policy, also available through our Gale resource through our website. And I can also put a link to that in the follow-up notes. Now, the truth is really only part of the story when it comes to propaganda. Have truths and misleading statements are, of course, especially in Black propaganda, which I'll talk about in a moment, par for course. I mean, if they want you to believe something and they feel like it'll get an emotional response, they'll lie about it. That's not really even the point. But something very important here is what's towards the end of this statement here is that it's important that whatever information is conveyed, that it rings through true to the intended audience. So if we're trying to convince somebody in a certain country that something is accurate, we want to make sure that people in that country believe that, that, that the propaganda uses the imagery, symbols, language that is going to be more convincing to them. There are a few ways to categorize propaganda. Some simple ones are white, gray, and black. Now, white and black propaganda are pretty familiar to most people. White propaganda is propaganda where the source is revealed, where we know who wrote an article, where we know who's backing the newspaper or online platform, radio station, etc. Examples are Voice of America or Russia Today or Pravda, which is the newspaper that you see in the image. Pravda means truth in Russian. And this was the organ of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union. It even says that right at the top of the newspaper. So that everybody, everybody knew that it says that right there. Everybody knew that Pravda was a government document. That, that it was it promoted the Soviet perspective. Black propaganda, on the other hand, is propaganda that's where the the source is not just hidden, but deliberately obfuscated, where where they might say it's written by somebody who it's not written by, where they might deliberately misrepresent who it's written by. Gray propaganda is kind of somewhere in the middle. It's gray. It's usually where the source of whatever the information is being conveyed is concealed. So like anonymous online comments or just comments from random people or where the a known account shares a letter, but the writer of the letter is not totally clear. And this is something that is very difficult to ascertain whether something is true. And that's why we always consider, you know, 
what is the source? We're trying to look for this. We want there to at least be a source. And then after that, we can decide whether it's whether the source is good or not. Another category of propaganda or ways to categorize propaganda is fast or slow. Fast propaganda is the kind of propaganda most of us think about when we see online propaganda. And that is the, the kind of quick propaganda on social media platforms. The difference between fast and slow propaganda is that fast propaganda tries to get an immediate response. It tries to get a quick response. It tries to get you angry right in the moment. Whereas slow propaganda is designed to take its time to really kind of inculcate it into the subject's mind. So an example of fast propaganda is, like I mentioned, social media platforms or something on a TV show, radio, something where you're going to hear it and you'll be able to get it understand right away and get it and have an emotional response right away. Slower propaganda is something more like a book, which you have to read and think about. You might discuss with people. So like a discussion group, an ongoing discussion group might be an example of slow propaganda or cultural exhibition where you have to see it, think about it, discuss it, where through this, through many of these kind of things focused on the same idea, ideology, viewpoint, cultural narrative, people might change their view of that or it might support their view of it. The purposes of propaganda, as I already started talking about, is to you know, push a specific viewpoint narrative or ideology. It could also be to dis increase distrust in your own government or the government of another country or others in authority. So there's a lot of COVID propaganda going around. And I'm not going to discuss the truth value of that stuff in this program, that's not really my purpose here. But I think we all know that there's a variety of information of various quality that exists around the COVID pandemic and also critical of various authorities when it comes to COVID. Now that, like I said, I'm not discussing the truth value of that, just to say that that it is, there is black propaganda as well, concealed propaganda. There are various forces trying to get us to question everything. And in a way, by doing that, they're also conflating the idea of truth or what is a fact, what is truth, the idea of truth. You know, I keep saying truth value uh, because something can doesn't necessarily have to be absolutely true or totally untrue. With online propaganda, it's something that's very difficult to determine whether something is completely true or totally untrue. And that is why sometimes the best we can do is say something sounds misleading or is pretty likely. Propaganda often also tries to sow division in society and we'll definitely be covering that a little bit more later. Now I have one of our first examples of, prop of a propaganda idea or propaganda tactic here. What you see in this slide is two Twitter profiles. Theoretically, both of these look like they're for Radio Free Asia, which is a, which I'm going to talk about in a moment, which is a United States backed uh, media platform uh, uh, talking about issues in East Asia. So though these look almost exactly the same, one of them is RFA Chinese and one of them is RNA Chinese. One of them has this this little uh, blue doodad that theoretically is supposed to say it's an authentic account, and one of them doesn't. One of them has a whole bunch of followers, and one of them doesn't. And yet to somebody who's not familiar or doesn't look very closely, as we sometimes do online, we're going boom, 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 we're just looking at a bunch of different stuff. It's very easy for this fake account, this one here, to pass off a piece of information as true and have people share it because they looked at 
this uncritically or quickly, or just didn't think about it. And so then all of a sudden they're sharing information that comes from an account that looks like it's from a United States backed source or to some people an authoritative source. So let's talk about this idea of white propaganda or state-sponsored media. I have two examples here, and there are, of course, so many examples of state-sponsored media around the world. The first example I, hear, I have here is Radio Free Asia, which is alongside, you know, uh, Radio uh, Voice of America, Radio Free, Euro Free Europe, and others, uh, are sponsored directly by the United States government through the U.S. Agency for Global Media, whose mission and I quote here, is to inform, engage, and connect people around the world in support of freedom and democracy, end quote. Their government affiliation is no secret. It's stated right there. If you go to Radio Free Asia and go to the About page, it's actually about us, um, you can see that it's immediately it says it's sponsored by this, this organization, and on that organization, you know, it's, it's a .gov website. So it's the United States government. Likewise, we have a Russia Today, commonly known as RT, which is a Russian government linked to media platform targeting non-Russian speakers. So RT publishes in a variety of languages and specifically focused on reaching people outside of Russia and not necessarily even Russians outside of Russia or Russian immigrants outside of Russia, but people who speak in different, so like Americans, RT is for you. And the mission of RT is that it offers news with an edge for viewers who want to question more. That's our slogan, question more. And I continue to quote, RT covers stories overlooked by the mainstream media, provides alternative perspectives on current affairs, and acquaints international audiences with a Russian viewpoint on major global events, end quote. And like Radio Free Asia, it is noted at the very, very bottom, you have to scroll quite a lot, on the RT About page that it is, and I quote, an autonomous nonprofit organization that is publicly financed from the budget of the Russian Federation. So it's also, you know, sponsored, paid for by the Russian government. Now, we'll, we'll see this a lot uh, in on organizations that, you know, pur purportedly are you know, nonpartisan or nonprofit, we'll say it's a nonprofit, it's autonomous or independent, or that it is, uh, you know, it's not political. And uh, it's kind of difficult to take that at face value when it's a, a nonprofit organization, but it's, it's, it's autonomous, but it's backed by the, the Russian government or the United States government or an, another big government. It doesn't necessarily mean, I'm not going to say 100% that, that everything on RT is, you know, fed by the Russian government or the narratives are fed by the Russian government. I don't know if that's true or if that's the case in Radio Free Asia or any other government-backed organization, but it's just something to think about. You know, when we consider the truth value of something or the what we're looking at, we want to know these kind of things and just be aware of that. So let's get a little bit deeper into the kind of stuff that you might see on Radio Free Asia or RT. So I pulled an article from the other day from Radio Free Asia, which is, by the way, available in Mandarin, Cantonese, Burmese, Korean, Lao, and a few other languages. Um, Radio Free Asia mostly reports on items related to East Asia with lots of virtual ink these days being spilled on aggressive takes on uh, China's COVID response, news of refugees and dissident ethnic groups, and occasional, you know, occasional Ukraine-Russia uh, story. A tactic that I, that I found frequently on Radio Free Asia is something that I call a single fact story, which is a story usually pretty short, like less than 500 words, you know, around 300 words, that's taken from a single fact. So it's like somebody did this thing. Or, you know, you're like, for instance, China did this thing when it comes to their COVID response. You know, a uh, minister said this, or this one city did this. And they'll 
write a very short, you know, very con almost contextless article about that. And there's just a lot of those kind of articles, which make make it easy for them to, you know, create this idea of a whole bunch of things happening when it's really when in in a different kind of uh, platform, a different kind of newspaper. Um, this would all be like in one one big article for them. It's like just a bunch of articles, and you'll find it in often true in in uh, state sponsored media or other kind of propaganda uh, organizations, even fake news, if you will. Uh, there, the articles are pretty short and don't don't have a ton of context, or if they do, they have a bunch of opinion and not very much fact. So the article here. You know, I've, I've had this on my screen for a long time. It's hard to read. It's pretty small. So I'm going to tell you it's the, the headline is North Korea inspects party membership cards after alcohol bill goes unpaid. And this is, I saw this and I said, okay, that's kind of weird. You know, this is not necessarily something that seems pertinent. The news value of this is it seems fairly low. Um, and, the, and the lead goes, authorities in North Korea are inspecting membership cards for the ruling workers party after a man used his to get out of paying for alcohol, thereby selling the party's good name, sources in the country, told Radio Free Asia. You know, it's almost, it almost feels like a joke. But apparently, sources the country said that, th that this is true. Now, if you read lower, you can see that this is actually only happening in one city. And then it says something about the meaning of the, uh, the membership in the Korean Workers' Party. It was once seen as prestigious as it conferred many benefits to citizens, such as preferable job placement and access to better education and housing. To be a member of the party requires exemplary action, such as superior militaries, but with the country's econo economy in shambles, the government is no longer able to provide the same advantages to party members. So some guy decided to, to use his to, to not pay for alcohol. It's, it's a pretty silly story and clearly intended to be embarrassing to the North Korean uh, government. But if we consider it from a, a larger perspective, even just reading it, I feel, I feel like it's pretty silly to even be in an actual newspaper. So let's talk about something you might see in RT. So here we got Elon Musk. We're all hearing about Elon Musk these days. And of course, RT, which has a way far wider range of coverage than Radio Free Asia. It's a, it covers it has a full geopolitical coverage from the Russian perspective alongside sports, Russian economic news, um, tabloid fodder. Um, not unlike the article you just read. Um, there was a recent headline on RT, um, Asian Nation Lifts Sex Doll Ban. Now, I, I wasn't interested in that. I just saw it and I thought, okay, that's, that's, that's interesting. You know, it's something about Russian economy, something about, you know, the war in Ukraine, and also that. Um, the country is, is uh, uh, South Korea, by the way. Uh, but it's it, the idea of having an article like that, not unlike what you just saw from Radio Free Asia, is clearly to to somehow embarrass or expose um, South Korea. And it, this is a this is a tactic that's it's often used um, in on RT. Uh, many of their stories are designed to embarrass or expose something uh, negative about Western countries, often the United States. A common tactic that they use um, in, in RT's reporting is to take a notable statement. Um, from a person who's usually notable, usually a government official or some kind of a CEO like Elon Musk, um, and then run an entire story on just like on that one statement, creating a whole narrative and contextualizing it in a way that really creates a neat narrative, regardless of the truth value of the claims. So here in the, the story we have here is every social media firm censors for U.S. government. Um, and the, the, the sub headline is that platforms remove content at the explicit direction of US federal agency, the Twitter CEO has claimed. And it's true, this has been a, around in tech news. Um, I don't know whether it's true that every social media firm censors for the US government, uh, but apparently, you know, the, the whole, the per, the, spark that led the story is that Elon Musk said it. And of course, there were some documents that were revealed. I haven't read the documents, so I don't know if it's true or not. But 
it it created a whole a narrative around that, um, excluding the fact that that many uh, governments in the world do this. Some even going as far as creating their own almost their own internet by censoring uh, nearly everything from the outside. So th also within the article is a lawsuit filed earlier this year by the attorneys general of Missouri and Louisiana alleges that the officials from no fewer than 12 government agencies met with the representatives of Twitter, Facebook, and other big tech firms in 2020 to decide which narratives and users to censor with topics ranging from alleged election interference to COVID-19. And this is accurate. There is such a lawsuit. It was filed in May of this year. It's ongoing. Um, there's, I don't think anything has been decided in the lawsuit. It's not, it's not done yet. So it's true. Um, but it's still, it, it alleges, we you know, we don't really know what the fact is of that. Um, the link there uh, links to Military Times, which is a news source from the United States. Um, it's a, a right-leaning um, news source. So, you know, take that with, with what you will. I, I looked at the article. I mean, it seemed fine. There were a lot of ads on military news. Uh, but you know, that's that usually you'll find links from RT to right leaning news sources in the United States. So let's go to a whole another example. And well, what we've been seeing thus far is an example of white propaganda where there are bylines. Um, the sponsorship of the websites ha are pretty clear. Um, we generally know kind of who it's coming from. Let's use, let's look at something that's completely opposite. Let's look at black propaganda. And uh, I say that with no pun intended. Um, let's look at the case of Blacktivist. Blacktivist it was a social media, a social justice organization who had a Facebook and Twitter accounts that were very popular, over 300,000 followers on Twitter and Facebook. So a total reach that is quite big, apparently bigger than the actual Black Lives Matter account. They posted heartfelt content supporting Black Americans. They sold merchandise with slogans so you can get t-shirts. And they organized promoted rallies. So this is something, you know, like what a social justice organization does, what a grassroots organization typically does. The problem is the Blacktivist was fake. The Blacktivist was not created by somebody who lived in the United States. We don't really know if the person that created was even Black. Probably not. It was created by a Russian agency called the Internet Research Agency, the IRA. Now, Blacktivist is just one example of a much larger propaganda operation directed by the Russian government and funded by Vladimir Putin's collaborators. In this case, this nondescript building is the, it was is one of the offices of the Internet Research Agency. The Internet Research Agency employs multilingual people that essentially created hundreds of fake accounts to carry out their purposes of, for instance, spreading the political divide in American society. To do this, they're going to create multiple personas. So you can be somebody from, you know, somebody from Louisiana or a, a person who you know, has progressive ideals from San Francisco, you know, whoever, you know, so, so many different personas. It's almost endless to, to consider, but personas from different political persuasions. And they're going to post online on different social media platforms and amplify different posts in order to get people upset. And some of the things that they've done is create accounts like Blacktivist, which gain a lot of followers. And not only that, but they often work on multiple sides of issues. So if you just imagine there's a protest on one side 
and this is this has actually happened that blacktivists supported and organized. And then there's an anti-protest on the other side. And they're both yelling at each other. These are people in real life across the street from each other yelling at each other. And what they're not realizing is that they're both being egged on by the Russian government. It sort of boggles the mind. So what I mentioned, creating multiple accounts to support different issues is something called astroturfing. Astroturfing is using grassroots lobbying techniques. Before the internet, it was you know a drafting letters for people. These days, it's an example might be that you know where you go to a political website and or you're part of some kind of organization and they'll create a letter a form letter for you and just sign your name at the bottom and you click and it'll email it to a, to a government representative. That's in a way a way of astroturfing. Although in that sense, you just you know you read the letter. Pr presumably, you believe what it says in the letter and you sign it and you send it. But you know, there's you create a petitions. In this case, there's you use techniques like you know, uh, create, have a whole bunch of comments or posts on on different topics or towards a certain person. The reason it's called astroturfing is because it is, it, well, I should say, the reason it, it it's a specific thing is because these are orchestrated by outside organizations. So it's not. It's it seems like a grassroots uprising or some kind of um, real feeling exposed among average people like you or me, but actually it's orchestrated by somebody else. And the way they do it is they use sock puppet accounts. And a sock puppet account is pretty much just, here's an account comes up, ha ha, here I am, boop, now it's gone. Now another account comes up, boop, now, now it's gone. It's all the same person. But they have a whole bunch of different accounts that they just pop up. So they might, they might be arguing with themselves. They might be arguing with other people online. Um, and you, know, you might be arguing with two of the same, two accounts from the same person. It's kind of funny, except for that it's actually, uh, it's actually kind of sad. So the the way that the IRA operates and all many other propaganda organizations operate is not necessarily through creating the logical, reasonable arguments, trying to actually convince people of certain viewpoints. Like most propaganda, well, like by definition propaganda, it's really generating an emotional response. So this is from a New York Times article. The job was not to put forward arguments, but to prompt a visceral emotional reaction, ideally one of indignation, said Artyom Baranov, a psychoanalyst by trading who was assigned to write posts on Russian politics. He didn't actually work for the IRA. He worked for a, a different Russian-backed organization, but, but part of the, uh, underneath the same umbrella. The task is to make a kind of explosion, to cause controversy, he said. You see, they're not trying to engage people in a civil discussion. You can't, there's no way to win an argument with somebody who works for the IRA, you know, who win one of these sock puppets accounts, because they don't care. All they want to do is get you angry. All they want to do is get you on the street yelling at somebody across the street. You know, they want to get you offended, the indignant, you know, whatever at the people in your life, your neighbors, your family, your friends, yeah, anybody whose guts you hate because of their, their complicated or, you know, to you, disgusting or challenging political opinions. Um, they work indiscriminately to make us angry and to a certain extent. You know, they just, they just, they'll focus on whatever issue works um, just to get a reaction. Once they find out what that button is, they just smash that button to get people angry. One example of this comes from a New York Times article from September of this year. And the article is titled, How Russian Trolls Helped Keep the Women's March Out of Lockstep. Some of you may have read the article. The article is about how the, how essentially this, uh, this woman, this activist, Linda Sarsour, who's a Muslim, 
was part of the Women's March Planning Committee. Um, there's the two, there's the, the 2017 Women's March, the 2019 Women's March. So she was part of the planning committee in 2017. And then not an uncontroversial figure, of course. Uh, but then after the 2017 March, there was a huge influx of attacks on her online. And what it what was found um, and described in this article is that a great many of those attacks, up to, you know, over a hundred posts a day, I think one one number of up to 184 posts a day about her that originated from fake people or sock puppet accounts. So they, what the article describes is how they tried a variety of different tactics to get people's, you know, get people's bile up about the Women's March. And the thing that got the most, the strongest reaction, strongest effect was by going after Linda Sarsour potentially because of her views on Israel, her use of the word jihad, her supposed support for Sharia law. Um, the accuracy of the posts that they created is really less important than the IRA's role in playing up. You know, these things already existed. These people were already saying these things about this lady. But the IRA really pushed these divisions, they created stronger divisive rhetoric to create a blizzard of controversy around this person where otherwise there may have been scattered showers. And so in the end, uh, Linda Sarsour stepped down from the women's, organizing the Women's March in 2019. Now, the interesting thing about this, this story and this article and it would be really be a disservice of me not to mention this because we're talking about how to analyze information. We're talking about how online propaganda works. And so I feel like it's important to let you know that one of the sources um, for this New York Times article, uh, and it was right there in the article, is Advanced Democracy Inc. You know, they, they were the ones who analyzed, they were one of the organizations that, that analyzed the tweets about Linda Sarsour and determined that they were from the Russian propaganda. Now, Advanced Democracy Inc. has a website. Their website is very simple. It doesn't have a whole lot on it. It has their uh, program areas. It has a mission statement, which is it is an independent, nonpartisan, not for profit organization that conducts public interest research and investigations. Uh, but their website has scanned out, but it has some political finance tracking. But it doesn't have any any of the reports. And the reason that I went to the website was because I, I had never heard of Advanced Democracy Inc. And I was curious. So I went to their website because I wanted a copy of the report. I wanted a copy of the analysis that the New York Times used for the story. And it was nowhere to be found, which I found odd. Another thing I found odd was that the organization didn't have any indication of who it was run by on their website. It had a Twitter account. I clicked through the Twitter account and boy, it did not seem like it was nonpartisan. It seemed awfully left-leaning in the tweets that it retweeted or the tweets that it, it would amplify. Um, it didn't say it didn't say who ran the organization, it didn't say who paid for it, who sponsored the organization. It, really didn't say a whole lot about it at all. But a quick online search revealed that the person who, who created it was a former Dianne Feinstein staffer. I mean, of course, we all know Dianne Feinstein is the Democratic Senator of California. So all that is to say, not that the information in the article is not true, not that the analysis is not accurate. I mean, there's no reason why I would think that they miscounted tweets or that they, they somehow uh, tried to fudge that information. It's only to say that the information landscape that we're looking at when it comes to determining the veracity of analyses of propaganda, some of which comes out several years after the fact, because it's not easy to see all of these things when you're on the ground that the information landscape is complex. There are a lot of different sides that the 
source of the sides, that the political leaning of the sides isn't always clear cut. And the political leaning of it doesn't always mean what we want it to mean, what we think it means. And so this article, which is about a controversial figure, it has a really specific neat narrative that the that Russian propaganda amplified the controversy surrounding this activist. Also that the analysis was by a firm led by a left-leaning person. You know, I don't know what that means, but it's something to think about. Something also to think about is, as I mentioned before, the propaganda is everywhere. The United States is not immune from covert online propaganda of the sort that the Internet Research Agency in Russia does. In fact, I've included a, an article that's in the slide, which you'll be able to click through when I send it to you next week. Um, or if you want to, you know, you can, you can search unheard voice evaluating five years of pro-Western covert influence operations and read the remaining like 40 or 50 pages. Um, these are, just, I just found a few articles outlining how different countries engage in Black propaganda online. Uh, I would think that if you search probably any country or any country with any kind of technical know-how, that you'll find that they are engaged in this sort of war of the mind online. Now let's, now I've given you some examples. Um, I've given you some sort of tactics, um, online propaganda. Let's talk about what we can do. And the next part of the presentation, at least a small part of it, is going to be from last week's presentation on spotting misinformation online. Because what is propaganda? It's not always untruthful, but it is often misinformation. And so how do we critically look at information? It's not easy, but we've got to try. So what we do in spotting information is consider the source, the information, and the motive behind the information. We've talked about the source. In white propaganda, the source is usually pretty clear. In gray propaganda, it's usually anonymous or unclear. In black propaganda, it's completely fake. So the idea of there being a source and being a clear source for what we're reading is pretty important when it comes to determining the credibility of information. It's not that hard these days with AI creating very real looking pictures of people to create a fake persona. And so sometimes if we're wondering about the veracity or the truthfulness of information, in an online article, we might want to do a little deeper search on the author. So if you Google the author and all we see is it's the same biography over uh, various news sources, then that person may not be a real person. Um, this often happens in re with review sites where it may be one person running the whole site with like five different personas. Um, with credible newspapers, um, like CNN, New York Times, etc., you don't usually have fake people writing the articles, but you might look into the author anyway. And same thing with the organization as a whole. Always go to the About Us page if you're wondering about the credibility of the website. You know, at least peruse the About Us page. Oftentimes it'll say who it's funded by, but you want to take note if it doesn't say who it's funded by, how they, you know, if it's not clear how this organization makes money, if they make money, if it's a business, if it's a nonprofit. Um, you know, if it says it's non, not, it's a not, non for, not for profit or a nonprofit, that really means very little these days when it comes to political leaning. If it says it's nonpartisan, you know, good. You know, we want to come to places with good faith, but we also want to analyze the actual content and re research and reports, articles to see if they're actually not uh, nonpartisan. You know, who do they cite? That's a really important way to determine whether an organization is balanced. So I'm not saying if they cite a right-leaning page that they're necessarily right-leaning or they're part of Russian propaganda or whatever. Uh, what I am saying is that if they only cite websites from a certain political perspective, left-leaning, right-leaning, whatever, 
then there's a good chance that they are creating a narrative that supports that political viewpoint. Researching the actual information. So we know that there's different kinds of information and nobody's going to be arguing that the sun is hot. You know, the sun is hot. We pretty much know that. And there are other scientific facts that are more or less, I mean, that are, that are, should I say more or less, that are true. We know that dogs have four legs. I mean, there's, there's facts that are obvious. Political facts, on the other hand, are a lot less obvious. And so, you know, especially where opinion comes into play, we want to be very clear about what in an article is a claim or an opinion and what is an actual fact. And sometimes people uh, try to pass off an opinion or a claim as a fact. And this is, happens a lot of propaganda. We, you know, we, we read that RT report where, you know, the social media firms are all, you know, uh, not controlled, but, you know, at least influenced by the United States government. Uh, it's his claimed Musk. That may or may not be true. I mean, it, Elon Musk just says it. And so that's, you know, that's something that we have to consider. And in that situation, we consider, we also consider our own, our own biases. If you know, it's, it's really easy to uncritically look at something, look at it and say, oh, oh yeah, of course, you know, I, I just see that. It doesn't matter who says it. I just see it and I know it's true. And you know what? It might be, but we want to look at claims a little bit more critically. We want to have some evidence for the claims that uh, that we see and that we believe. And we want that evidence to be um, solid. We want that evidence to come from a variety of sources and that aren't all just linking to each other. We're going to verify images and videos to make sure that they aren't doctored. That's really difficult to do for people who aren't tech savvy, but oftentimes it just comes to following your nose, or at least it just comes to th considering things that are that are common sense or they're not common sense. If something looks weird, something looks like it probably isn't true based on what you know about that person, or what you know about that situation, then you want to maybe see if that you can find that image elsewhere or find another image of that event from another place and see if, if whatever that image is, is accurate. Because many times propagandists will use stories uh, or yeah, I should say images from totally different places that seem like they might be from, from a certain place, but are just, just grabbed from the internet about a certain topic that completely unrelated. And images really convince us of a lot of things. So we need to be aware and clear of whether an image is real or fake, or at least know that they might not be if the source that you're looking at, or the organization that you're looking at is not the most uh, trustworthy. And then, of course, you know, this is this is with state sponsored propaganda, with propaganda, with this presentation, the motive is is very important. You know, we see something, you know, we see that article about North Korea. Um, we see that the article about, you know, the sex dolls. Um, we wonder, why is this being shared? You know, what's the goal of RT or what's the goal of Radio Free Asia in putting those less than newsworthy stories onto their front page? Well, the goal seems to be to embarrass the countries, the, the source countries, uh, because I can't think of any other, I can't think of many people being interested in, in those stories, at least not so interested they should be on the front page. You know, I don't know, maybe, maybe you disagree. But to consider the motive of everything that's being shared somewhere, you know, why are they writing this? Is it because it's newsworthy? Is it because it has certain news values they like? Is it because it's just clickbait? Is it because it has, there's a lot of drama involved and people are going to go to it, even though it's really a tempest in a teapot? That's what we want to think about. It is a source of political leaning. Are they trying to create a certain narrative perspective? Who benefits from you reading this article and sharing it on social media? Is it to progress a certain politician? Is it to hamper another politician? Who benefits? We want to be careful about being in our own filter bubbles. And that's why you know, I mentioned looking at multiple sources, not all the ones that are citing each other, but sources that are, might be outside of what you usually look at. A filter bubble is defined as sort of a, an ideological field that you stay in. And so, you know, all you, all your friends might be posting about the same thing from the same perspective. 
from the same sources. And uh, that's comfortable for us. You know, we, we have a certain, uh, what do they call it? It's called a confirmation bias where we see something and because we believe it, we, we have more, it's more, we're more likely to think that it's true. Um, partially that, that's the reason for that is because we're in all afraid. We see the same thing over and over and over again. And when we see something else, it just, it, it's jarring for us. And so that's why it's important to, on a regular basis, try to consider the view from various sides, even if it's not true, even if you know that it's, that you know, that it's not as accurate, it's still good to know and to see. And so websites like all sides, it's allsides.com, um, is, uh, yeah, it's allsides.com, is really good because right on that website, they have a variety of perspectives, left, right, and center. Well, United States, left, right, and center, you know, what left, right, and center in different parts of the country, and I mean, different parts of the world, even different parts of the country um, vary. But this is, you know, United States focused. And all sides is really good about showing you different sides and also declaring their own political leanings and their and their funding. If you go to their about us page, they're real, they go pretty in depth about how they get funded and you know, who supports them. And if you're especially interested in filter bubbles, um, there was a book in, published in 2011 by Eli Perzer called The Filter Bubble, What the Internet is Hiding from You. I read the book years ago and it was, it's a pretty short book and it's interesting. And I, since then, I mean, there, there have been a lot of other things published about filter bubbles. The point is to take a needle and pop yours so that you don't get stuck in only one narrow ideological perspective. So let's go on and we're getting towards the end of our presentation here. Two tips to avoid tipping over. And by tipping over, I mean tipping over into to emotional responses to online propaganda because it's so easy these days. I mean, we just, we read things and I know people who uh, get so worked up about, you know, Donald Trump, Joe Biden, all of the, the different political figures, all the different things that happen that they almost can't function because they're so wrapped up. They, they, they have got the notifications popping up on their phone and they just, ah, oh, they're really angry. So how do we avoid that sort of thing? The first thing is, particularly when we're looking at online content from sources that we're not sure about, is, is to avoid dualistic thinking. So I've been talking about truth value, and the idea is to think of truth on a spectrum, whether rather than solely being true or not true. Of course, in reality, things are, you know, there are facts, there are things that are true and they're not true. But we're talking, we have to almost pretend because we sometimes we don't know and there's no way for us to know. So we have to think of a spectrum from totally untrue, totally true, and in between is probably untrue, seems likely, I don't know, or seems unlikely. And you look at all of the different things that I mentioned when it comes to misinformation and you consider all the different tactics that um, that propagandists use and based on that, you make a determination. You consider also what you know about the topic. You know, you, some people have been following certain topics for a really long time, have a really good perspective and idea of a, a geopol geopolitics in a certain place. Or you know that you don't have an idea of geopolitics in a certain place. And that's when I was doing research about this presentation, there was certain examples that I couldn't use because I just didn't know enough. I couldn't, I didn't know enough to make my own judgment about whether something was a good resource or whether something was propaganda or not, because I just didn't know enough about the topic. And so knowing that, uh, my idea of whether something is true or not is a lot more in the middle. We can't be researching everything. You know, we'd spend all our time going down rabbit holes doing research. So usually the way I do it is I use a little heuristic called if an article makes me say, wait, what? Or a claim or an image makes me say, wait, what? If something just doesn't seem true based on what I know, if, some, if something just seems a little bit odd, like I saw Advanced Democracy Inc. and I go, oh, I've never heard of that. Wait, what? Um, and so then I looked it up. 
or you know any anything else if i see if i i saw that 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 web lawsuit from the rt article and i thought wait what i've never heard of that and so i clicked through and i read military news and i looked at that website and then i tried to find in, information about that lawsuit somewhere else and i found it and so okay i saw i see this this is a real thing this this lawsuit exists you know regardless of whether the original link um you know, I looked at some other stuff on military news and said, so, okay, I, I see, I see where this is coming from. So anytime something makes you say, wait, what? That's a good, that's a good kind of point to, to look further than, than what you see right on the page. Be alert for emotional stimuli, particularly when reading some stuff like state-sponsored media or article or you know when you get reshares from people online, when you're not sure about a, a, a news source or whatever, any source of information, think about whether it makes you feel something. Think about whether the intention of it is made to make you feel something. Look at the headline. Is it a clickbait headline? Clickbait means it's phrased in a way that creates a certain suspense that makes you click it. And sometimes what you click through doesn't even answer the question and or uh, the answer is not all that interesting. But you know, is this article trying to make you angry? Is this article trying to make you sad? Is this trying to, article trying to make you happy? Any kind of emotional response could mean that what you're looking at is not necessarily intended to inform, but to incite. Now, I say avoid online arguments on this slide, and I, I think that's true. You know, I, I've mentioned before in other programs that I, I, I really like a good argument. I'm into it. Uh, but... I often try to avoid arguments online, particularly with people that I don't know, partially because there's really oftentimes no winning that argument. I mean, you're not really informing that person, and that person's not really informing you. And too often it devolves into just ad hominem attacks, which means you're attacking that person rather than their point of view, or just not not a not helpful exchange. And it has too much it has too much potential to become emotional and to make me annoyed. And I don't want to be annoyed. But it's not really avoiding online arguments that I want to convey here. It's more that you should act effectively when it comes to uh, political action. Having an argument with somebody online or resharing some kind of silly article or some kind of article that's, that's really you know, infuriating and written in a way to make it so is not necessarily a constructive way of carrying out political action. Rather than that, maybe write in a letter to write a letter to your representative. Maybe go precinct walking for a candidate you believe in. You know, do something that actually has an effect rather than something that amplifies potentially nefarious sources or just creates an uncivil atmosphere online, to, to be honest. Finally, it's really important to, particularly if you know you're the type of person who gets really wrapped up in a news story, is to try to maintain perspective. You know, some, some of the stuff that we've been talking about, some of the examples that I've given you here, are, you know, they're pretty, you know, they, 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 can, make, they can make you angry. You know, it's, you can, the idea that propaganda is everywhere, that the United States is engaging in China, Iran, all sorts, all the all countries or many countries with some kind of technical prowess are engaged in propaganda. You know that that feels really challenging. But we also have to understand that how does that those how do those things affect our lives in person? You know, the sun goes up, the sun goes down. We wake up in the morning, we go to work. You know, we have our hobbies, we have our family, we have our friends. We have to understand that frequently those things don't affect our lives directly and that we need to remember that we need to we need to understand that we need to keep that in mind because it's just sometimes not worth it to go down that rabbit hole and i think i'll end there now of course if you're interested in more about online propaganda or propaganda in general uh you can uh you can search our website uh, for books, ebooks, audiobooks. You can go to lacountylibrary.org backslash learn for online classes. There's I don't know if we have any online classes on propaganda specifically. We do have some on you know determining whether information is accurate.
or like information literacy. Um, we have quite a few uh, classes that we've done here every Thursday at 11 o'clock on misinformation, scams, things like that. And we'll be doing more, of course, in the future. And we have a lot of reference materials that you can access online. I mentioned the Gale Reference Library a few times. The Gale Reference Library is literally a online collection of giant reference books that's just available to you, you know, all full text. You can download PDFs of certain articles. You know, I like it a lot. When I'm researching something, I just go straight. I don't even search Google sometimes. I just go straight there because oftentimes I know I'm going to get good information. And if you're interested in finding out information, asking, um, you can always call your local library. You can text the library at 626-394-4019, Monday through Friday, 12 to 6. You can email us at the Contact Us page on our website. And of course, we have a chat service. Um, instant librarian Monday through Friday 12 to 6 you can do it right from our website you go to the lacountylibrary.org backslash contact us and right on there there's a little chat box and you can chat with a librarian and we can help you find books and much more and if you're interested in more virtual events go to lacountylibrary.org on the top right hand side there's a little black box. You hover over that box and you go to virtual programming and it'll give you all of our virtual programs, not to just digital literacy courses, but all of them for all ages. And with that, I thank you for listening and I'm, I'm looking forward to answering your questions. I've, I've been seeing some popping up and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm interested in what, what you're interested in. All right, thank you, Oleg, for that interesting and informative presentation on online propaganda. So if you have any questions, now is the time to post them in the Q&A. I see there are already a few there, but while you're doing that, I wanna remind you all that today's program is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel. And here's a link to our digital literacy playlist in the chat. And also before you go, please take a moment to fill out our short post event survey. Your feedback and suggestions are valuable to us because it lets us understand how you feel about our programs while letting us know what topics that you are interested in learning more about. And a lot of times those topics will turn up in a future program somewhere down the line. So here's a link to our post event survey. And let's take a look at the Q&A. All right, so first question, Oleg. You mentioned state propaganda earlier, as in government sponsored. So doesn't some level of propaganda exist that smears, discredits, and demonizes any legit questioning or open dialogue debate that challenges their narrative? Well, I'm going to have to. Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to repeat. Actually, the link you posted for the survey is not correct. That's actually oh. the wrong. The wrong survey. Don't okay. fill out that survey that Lawrence just posted. Uh, let me see if I can get you. Let me get you the real survey. Um, for this, for this, because the one for this program is a little bit different than, than some of the other ones. I see. Um, it's actually this one. This is, this is the real link. So if you want to fill out, if you already started filling it out, you know, just, you can just exit and fill out the one behind, behind this link here. This is, this is really the one for this program. Okay. So, uh, sorry. Can you, okay, so I see the question. You mentioned state propaganda earlier as in government. So there's a lot, there's a lot to that question. So I need, I, I'm, I'm looking at it because it makes it a little bit easier for me. As in government spot is, so doesn't some level exist that smears is credit to any legit questioning or open dialogue debate? Yes, absolutely. Sometimes that's the purpose of propaganda. Uh, sometimes the, the purpose of propaganda is literally to make you question the, the reality. Uh, reality and, and to make you question legit conversation and dialogue. It makes you, it makes you too angry to engage in real dialogue. Um, you know, what, what I think is an ideal situation, I don't know about how everybody else, um, I feel like an ideal situation is where you can talk to somebody who disagrees with you and not devolve into shouting, which so often happens online. But sometimes because of the, the emotional uh, content that is often created by fake news sources or 
government sponsored propaganda, um, people get really riled up and angry at the other side and can't just talk, can't just make it make it seem like you're actually talking about, you know, points of view, opinions that people are allowed to have. All right, uh, what's the next question? Uh, next question, um, let's see. Are you implying that RFA does not propagandize while RT does? No, I'm not. I'm saying. I'm saying. Actually, I'm saying. Yeah, I'm. I'm saying that uh, RFA is a. It's a government sponsored. It's government sponsored media. Uh, the Radio Free Asia is a United States sponsored uh, website, and that that article about North Korea. Um, I don't know whether it's true or not, but it feels like it, the idea is to embarrass. North Korea, not necessarily to report on an actual, you know, legit, useful news story. So no, I mean, I, I'm, I'm saying that they're both examples of, you know, potential propaganda, or at least white propaganda. Okay, uh, next question. How did you learn that Blacktivist was created by a Russian agency? Well, I'll tell you, it wasn't original research. I wasn't the one who created, who determined that. Um, that was, there were reports by cybersecurity firms that were then reported on by a variety of newspapers. Okay. Um, all right, next question. Um, on these propaganda sites, is there a risk of being hacked if you visit those sites? Usually not if you just go to the website. Um, yeah, there's, it's pretty unlikely unless you, unless you download something, then it's, 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 it's possible. But if you just visit the website, no, it's, it's pretty unlikely. I think more to the point, they want you to actually read the content. Um, I think that if they, you know, they want your eyeballs and they want your brain. Yeah, um, that, that was the next uh, comment. It seems like the object is to hack your brain instead of your computer. Yes, correct. Other people want to hack your computer. Um, different. It's like we're talking about motive. Um, the motive of propagandists is they want to. They want you to read their stuff. They want you to believe their stuff. They want you to feel angry about it, or sad, or whatever. Hmm. All right. Uh, next question: Are there any terms out there that are alternative to white propaganda and black propaganda? Uh, I find those terms a bit confusing in that they could be misconstrued to be racial terms. Oh, yeah. I don't know if there are alternative terms to that. There probably are. I mean, we said like revealed and concealed propaganda. Um, those are just the terms that that are used in, in the academic literature on those topics. And they have, really have nothing to do with, with race at all. Okay. Uh, next question. We often have to search the sources of our broadcast news because of who owns them. Would you agree? I think it's certainly helpful. Now, I will say that just because some a certain person owns a news site doesn't automatically mean that that person and that person's point of view control that site. But it's useful to know. It's one of those things that you use when it comes to weighing the truth value of something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I also want to share something that, that somebody mentioned in the chat. Um, there are tools to look up um, who owns certain domain names and websites. Um, so those are um, I can and also who is where you can just kind of type the name of the um, type the name of a website in there and see their registration data. Yeah, you just type um, the URL. Yeah. Um, and that's useful sometimes. I mean, sometimes you have the actual person's name and their address and everything. And sometimes there's just, uh, it's just, it's either it's private or it's blocked or it's something else. It's somebody else because, you know, it's, um, people can put in various things or have somebody else register a website for them. But for smaller news sources, that, that, is, that is a good, you know, like, like independent journalist websites, that's a good uh, source to look at. Okay, uh, next question. How do you prevent search engine algorithms promoting your beliefs with false information? That's yes, a so that's a great question. And the way you do that is that you use search engines like DuckDuckGo, Duck, Duck, which don't track you, and which don't, don't determine the search results you get from previous searches that you've made. All right, uh, next question. Can you access Gale Reference Library online? 
Absolutely. That's where you, exactly where you access it. You go to our website, you click on the top. In fact, let me let me just post a link right now. Um, yeah, you it's it's a completely online resource. It's like, you know, big libraries have giant sections with reference books. That's what the Gale reference library is just online. So let me see if I can get let me see if I can get you a direct link. I'm going to give you a link to our database page. And I usually what I usually just do is I usually just search Gale. So I'm going to do send, just send you a link to our databases. And I search Gale in the Gale search box. And it's uh, you scroll down a little bit and it's Gale e, it's called Gale eBooks. Actually, you know what? I can send you a direct link to it. Here, I'll post a direct link to it. There you go. So if you click there, you'll have to enter your library card number in, and then you'll be able to get in. Um, I really like that resource. It's it's something that I think if more people knew about it, that more people would use. Okay, what else? Um, okay, so here's a question. What is that symbol you recognize as a legitimate link or source? Um, I, I think they might be referring to, to, to the Twitter accounts. Um, oh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay. So um, I don't know how it is now because Twitter's Twitter's in a great state of change. Um, usually the uh, in the past, I don't know how it is now, uh, the blue circle by the Twitter account. Let me bring up the slide again. How did I exit it? I think I exit, I'm going to bring up my presentation again. I clicked out of it a second ago. Um, I'll bring up, I'll, I'll show you what I mean or what, what the questioner means. But yeah, that, that blue usually was uh, meant that it was an authentic account or authenticated account. So it was like if celebrities, a celebrity had an account, um, they would have that, and it was verified by Twitter, then it would have that little blue, the little blue mark. Now I think it means something different. And so I, I don't want to give you false information. I'm, I'm not a, a Twitter user. Um, so I don't want to give you a, a bad information about what that blue mark means now. But here, let me going to go ahead and share that. And it is, oh, there it is. Okay. So it's uh, this little, let me draw. A little, so here's a slide and it's this little blue check mark here. It's a white check mark in a blue circle. So it's, you see it, it it's here on RFA Chinese, which is the actual Twitter account for Radio Free Asia in Chinese. And then here there isn't one. And here it says also says RNA Chinese. Very small difference. When I first saw it, I was like, wait, these are, these look way oh, oh, oh I see. And once I saw that it was it, it changed. It changed it. This was this was from an image from a ProPublica article about the Chinese uh, Twitter propaganda. All right, what's the next question? All right. Um, let's see, is Voice of America doing propaganda? It's state sponsored. So in, a, it, I'm not saying whether the things on there are true or not, uh, because they absolutely might be. But yeah, it's a state sponsored site. It's a state sponsored uh, news source. All right. Uh, next question. Are there any buzzwords that are a red flag in that the new source might be untrustworthy? I always, whenever I see a new source that says that they're providing, and now I'm sort of singling out RT here, um, whose slogan is question more. And I'm not saying, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about RT specifically, but new sources that say, you know, we're going to cover things that the mainstream media doesn't cover. Uh, whenever I see that, it makes me go, okay, because oftentimes they don't actually cover things that the mainstream media doesn't cover in the sense that if you actually search news, like other news sources, you'll see that they're actually are covering that thing. And oftentimes um, the sources that, that this site uses don't seem to, these kind of sites don't seem to be as well backed up as uh, mainstream media. Um, there, there are so many mainstream media news sources from various perspectives that it that when a site says, um, I'm not, you know, we, we try to, we're outside of the mainstream media, we're super, super independent or whatever, or, or kind of plastic or whatever it is, that always makes me go, hmm. 
Yeah, um, and I just want to add, um, you know, if there's anything that plays on your emotions that's sensationalist, maybe just take a moment to step back and, and you know, just see if, is this really legitimate or are they just trying to get a rise out of you? Um, yep. Yeah, the emotional nice. stimuli bit. That's really important. Okay, um, it looks like that's about it for the questions. Um, if you have any more questions, now's the time. Um, let's see. Yeah, the, there's comment. Thank you, Oleg, for the interesting and informative presentation. Thanks right. for being here. Yeah. Um, okay, so if there aren't any more questions, then uh, that's the program. Thank you so much for attending and wish you all um, a happy new year. And we'll see you at the next digital literacy program.